This is lecture 12 on DSP and we continue our discussion on Z transforms. In lecture 11, we had introduced the circulant matrix for computing circular convolution and then we showed how to compute two endpoint DFTs by computing a single endpoint DFT that is by combining the two sequences in an analytic manner that is you put g of n plus j times h of n and then compute the endpoint circular convolution. We give an example then we introduce the z transform again as a summation g of n z to the power minus n summation going from n equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. We showed its relationship to Z tran to Fourier transforms and we also said that the ROC region of convergence is extremely important. Then we made a special point that if you have a finite sequence, a finite sequence then the ROC does not matter whether it is causal, anti-causal or uh, combination of causal and anti-causal. The ROC is the whole Z plane. ROC is all Z except possibly Z equal to 0 and Z equal to infinity. It can be both or it can be one of them except Z equal to 0 or Z equal to infinity or both. That is it. The ROC is the total Z plane. But if it is an infinite sequence, then the ROC in general, infinite sequence, the ROC in general is an annular region between two circles the radii of the circles, I introduced the subscripts L and R. Um, it is difficult to keep track of this, so I will simplify this. I will call this smaller circle as radius R1 and the larger circle as radius R2. 2 is greater than 1 and therefore it is easier to follow. Okay? The ROC in general is this where R1 can be <coughs> as small as 0, R2 can be as large as infinity. Okay? <coughs> and for an infinite sequence, the Z transform is a rational function of the form P of Z by Q of Z. A rational function is a ratio of polynomials and a polynomial is a finite series containing only integral integral positive powers of the variable p z in fact we write as a polynomial in z inverse the variable is z inverse if z is the variable then p z is not a polynomial is that clear z inverse is the variable 1 plus x plus x square is a polynomial but 1 plus x to the minus 1 plus x to the minus 2 is not a polynomial in x, but it is a polynomial in x inverse. Okay. From this rational function, we defined what poles and zeros are. <coughs> and we said that the ROC is bounded by the pole. We made a statement is bounded by the pole largest at a largest distance from the origin. This is for a special type of sequence. This is for causal sequences. On the other hand, if it is an anti-causal sequence, then the ROC is, is bounded by the pole which is closest to the origin. Okay? For a causal sequence, the ROC is outside a circle for an anti-causal sequence, the ROC is inside a circle. And then we uh, <coughs> took some examples. We made a table of the basic Z transforms that is delta N, U of N, alpha to the N, UN, 
and r to the n cosine n omega 0 u of n or r to the n sin n omega 0 u of n. If you know these transforms then you can solve almost any problem in z transforms provided you keep your eyes and ears open about the ROC, the region of convergence. In Fourier transform there is no such complication. In Z transform there is a complication that the ROC is extremely important. In fact, we will show that the same Z transform can represent different ROCs. We will show by an example, but this is to come a little later. We also showed that there are sequences for which Z transform do, does not exist. For example, alpha to the n, the Z transform does not exist because it consists of two parts, the right sided sequence and the left sided sequence and the two ROCs do not have an overlapping region. There is an overlapping region, a circle of radius mod alpha but on that is located the pole and therefore there is no ROC. It is important to understand this. Yes. Was there a question? All right. <clears throat> now we talk of inverse Z transform. You recall that the Z transform G of Z is summation g n z to the power minus n but z in general is r e to the power j omega it is a complex quantity. So, r to the minus n e to the minus j omega n n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. This can also be looked upon as the Fourier transform of this sequence g n r to the minus n. So, the inverse Fourier transform relationship should hold. In other words, we should have g n r to the minus n, the sequence can be restored, can be recovered from the Fourier transform by taking the integral 1 by 2 pi no j minus pi to pi capital G of e to the power capital G of R e to the power j omega okay, e to the j n omega small z is R e to the power j omega. So, capital G R e to the j omega e to the j n omega then d omega. Now, I can transfer this R to the minus n to the right hand side inside the integral because the variable is omega and therefore, I can write this as 1 over 2 pi integral minus pi to pi capital G. Let us restore small z r e to the power j omega can be written as small z and r to the n if it is brought on this side then this is z to the n then there is a d omega. We must change the variable because our function is that of z. Now, z equal to r e to the power j omega means that d z is equal to r, r is a constant, omega is the variable. So, r e to the power j omega multiplied by j d omega and therefore, we can replace d omega by d z divided by r this is z. So, I can replace d omega <coughs> by d z by j times z which gives me g of n. I made a mistake here. In the previous one, this is g n. This is g n. Okay. Therefore, g n becomes equal to 1 over 2 pi. We will not put the integral limits now. g of z 
z to the n d z over j z. Now, <coughs> this, this is equal to 1 over 2 pi j. Integral limits shall come a little later. g z, z to the n minus 1, j has come here multiplied by d z. Now, <coughs> what should be the limits of integral? z is a is a two dimensional plane. It has no limits. It goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in a complex manner. It is not a real quantity. On the other hand, what was the idea in integrating over omega? Omega goes over a circle from minus pi to plus pi. In other words, it makes a closed contour. And therefore, when you go from the unit circle to, to the total complex plane, the integration becomes a contour integration. In other words, what you should do is, you should choose a contour, you should choose a contour which <coughs> let us call this contour as C and you know in contour integration we go in the anti-clockwise direction because for omega we had gone from omega equal to 0 in the anti-clockwise direction. So, the direction must be the same, but the contour must be such that it does not pass through any of the singularities of this function g z z to the power n minus 1 and one of the singularities is at z equal to 0 because if you put n equal to 0 here then you get z inverse and therefore there is a singularity for n equal to 0 at z equal to 0 and therefore the contour is to be such that it is outside the poles, it does not encounter any pole including the pole at the origin. Now, you cannot draw, if you have to draw a contour, closed contour, it must be around z equal to 0 and therefore, any contour c made traversed in the anti-clockwise direction which includes the point at the origin is good enough and usually we choose this to be a circle all right a circle such that it enclose well circle with center at the origin this is the simplest thing to do however for dsp we don't have to evaluate this contour integration contour integration evaluation is not uh, <coughs> a routine job it has to be done with lot of care all right we do not have to do because our functions g of z are always rational p of z by q of z and for rational functions there are better alternative methods. But if you have to evaluate this contour integral the gentleman Cauchy C A U C H Y comes to rescue Cauchy has a theorem called Cauchy's residue theorem which says that this integral this this total integral is equal to sum of the residues at the poles inside the contour you you for, you can forget about those outside the contour at the poles inside the contour poles of not gz but gz z to the power n minus 1 all right <coughs> we don't have to apply cauchy's residue theorem either we, we have better alternatives for, <coughs> for rational functions which is what we are concerned with and the method is that of partial fraction expansion. I told you that if you know the z transform of delta n u of n alpha to the n u n and r to the n cosine n omega 0 or sin n omega 0 u n then you can perform any z transform or its inverse also. We will take one example, <coughs> we will take several examples one by one. Uh, first is you have to find out a causal h of n, 
causal H of n such that its Z transform capital H of Z is Z times Z plus 2 Z minus 0.2 Z plus 0.6. The first thing you do when you encounter such a expression is to express it as a rational function in Z inverse. First thing that you do is therefore you divide by Z squared both the numerator and denominator then you get 1 plus 2 Z inverse 1 minus 0.2 Z inverse 1 plus 0.6 Z inverse and then you expand in partial fraction that is you write this as capital A divided by 1 minus 0.2 Z inverse plus capital B 1 plus 0.6 Z inverse. Why do you write it in this form? Because you know the Z transform of alpha to the n u n as 1 by 1 minus alpha Z inverse. So if you can express it in this form then your job is done and capital A and capital B are found in the usual manner. Capital A for example <coughs> would be 1 minus 0.2 Z inverse multiplied by H of Z under the condition 0.2 Z inverse equal to 1 all right or Z equal to 5 agreed we do not use Z equal to 5 we leave it in this form these are some of the pardon me Z inverse equal to 5 okay Z equal to 0 0.2 agreed <coughs> so this becomes 1 plus 2 Z inverse divided by 1 plus 0.6 Z inverse under the condition 0.2 Z inverse equal to 1. We do not have to worry about uh, what is the value of Z. This is good enough. You see here I can write this as 1 plus 10 divided by 1 plus 0.6 Z inverse is 3 times this so 3 so it is 11 by 3 which is equal to 2 point 11 by 4 2.75 agreed. Similarly you can find B as minus 1.75 and if you substitute this <coughs> if you substitute this you get H of Z as equal to 2.75 divided by 1 minus what was it 0.2 Z inverse plus minus 1.75 divided by 1 plus 0.6 Z inverse and therefore H of n is equal to 2.75 we apply that formula it is a 1 to 1 transformation and therefore 0.2 to the power n u n minus 1.75 minus 0.6 you understand why this plus 0.6 to the power n u of n. <coughs> this is the inverse transform is that okay? This is the inverse transform because we wanted a causal sequence if it was not then we would have a problem. Now instead of asking for a causal sequence You see the original problem if you go back the ROC is not specified but an equivalent specification is given because you are asking for a causal H of n. So if causal H of n was not given then the answer to the inverse transform would not have been unique. The answer that we have worked out will be correct only if only if it is stated that z greater than 0.6 agreed so they are equivalent statements 
the ROC is outside a circle of radius 0 0.6 specifies that the inverse transform shall be causal. One of the two must be given. The other point that one should make <coughs> at this juncture is that we have taken, oh no, I have another point to make. Now, <coughs> we go back to the original, uh, original problem. How do you know that these two terms are adequate partial fraction expansions? On the other hand, if you make a partial fraction expansion of this, there shall be a constant, is not that right? Yes, sir. At infinity, there shall be a constant. Yes. The constant shall be equal to 1, z squared by z squared. There is no constant here. Why? Because the numerator is 1 degree less than the denominator. If the numerator also had another factor like this, then there would have been a constant term. Please, please uh, take care of this. Suppose the numerator, now let us take an example. Suppose the numerator degree was higher. Suppose we have a h of z which is p of z divided by q of z and p of z degree equal to 3 and q of z degree equal to 2. All right? and then the partial fraction expansion of this shall have first a constant term k0 plus k1 z inverse. If you take this out, how do you take them out? You can make a long division. Okay, You can make a division of Pz by Qz, take out a K1z inverse term and a K0, a constant term. Then the remainder, let us say P1z by Qz will be such that the degree of Q is 2, but the degree of P1 shall be 1. Agreed? And then you, you expand this into two fractions, two rational functions. Okay? Is the point clear? You must look at the given function very carefully. And if necessary, you have to take out a polynomial. Inversion of K0 is not a problem. What is it? K0 delta n. And K1 z inverse? K1 delta n minus 1. All right. Good. Now, if <coughs> There, there was another simplifying feature about this problem that there was no repeated poles. The poles were distinct one at minus one at plus point two plus point two or plus point two and minus point two. No. One by point two. Z inverse Five. Five. Yes, you were right. Point two 1 minus point 0.2 z inverse equal to 0. This gives point 0.2 z inverse equal to 1. So, z equal to point 0.2. Point you are right. The poles were at point 0.2 plus point 0.2 and minus point 0.6. All right. They were distinct. If there are repeated poles, then what do you do? If there are repeated poles, let us say we take a general case. Suppose g of z is some numerator divided by 1 minus p z inverse to the power l. This root at z equal to p, the pole at z equal to p is repeated capital N number of times. And then you have some uh, other some other polynomial, let us say q1 of z. All right. We have used a capital N. Well, it does not matter what it is. Q1 of z contains the other poles. Q1 of z does not contain the pole at z equal to p. All of them have been taken care of. Then, provided n of z degree is less than L plus degree of Q1, you understand? That is the numerator degree is less than the denominator degree. Then this can be written as A1, <coughs> let me keep my symbols. A i divided by 1 minus p z inverse 
to the power i, where i goes from 1 to l. That is, the repeated roots would give rise to a partial fraction expansion starting with a 1 divided by 1 minus p is the inverse, a 2 plus divided by 1 minus p is the inverse whole squared up to a l divided by 1 minus p is the inverse to the power l. So, there are capital L number of constants all right and then plus the rest of the function, rest of the function will be q 1 of z and in the numerator you shall have a correspondingly reduced polynomial n 1 of z which you can take care of by partial fraction expansion and then you invert this ok. The inversion of this that is z inverse of a i divided by 1 minus p z inverse to the power i is not a problem. You can do it yourself by taking help of uh, <coughs> the fact that the z transform of n times g of n is given by minus z d g dc. If you take take account of this then you can find a general formula for the inversion of this. We shall come back to this later. <coughs> but then how do you find the ai's the coefficients? Well all textbooks give this formula that is ai a very ugly looking formula and I unless I am forced to I never use it but anyway it is good to know L minus I factorial minus P to the power L minus I then D L minus I D Z inverse L minus I L minus ith differential coefficient of 1 minus p z inverse to the power L g of z evaluated at z equal to p. So, the general formula looks horrible. <laughs> you have to you have to differentiate L minus i times divide by this and then put z equal to p and at any step you can make a mistake. What I do is slightly different. Uh, what I do is the following. Let us uh, take an example to illustrate what I do and uh, I am sure you will find it more convenient than differentiating this. And uh, the scope of making a mistake in my procedure is much less. What I do is the following. Uh, Let us say I have a g of z which is n of z divided by I will take a, a, a pole repeated three times ok an example <laughs> multiplied by let us say alpha z inverse all right where <coughs> it is assumed that n z degree is less than 4 if the numerator degree is less than the denominator degree then we call it a proper rational function. There is nothing improper about the other rational function is the degree of uh, numerator exceeds or is equal to the denominator there is nothing improper uh, but then this term has gone into the literature uh, and we shall use it. Now the partial fraction expansion of this would be a 1 divided by 1 minus p z inverse plus a 2 divided by 1 minus p z inverse whole squared plus a 3 divided by 1 minus p z inverse whole cubed plus b divided by 1 minus alpha z inverse ok. We can find out b very easily b you multiply this by 1 minus alpha z inverse and put alpha z inverse equal to 1. So, b equal to 1 minus alpha z inverse multiplied by g of z 
put alpha z inverse equal to 1. Do not bother about finding the value of z. No, alpha z inverse equal to 1 is good enough. That is z inverse is 1 by alpha. B, A3 can also be found out easily. A3 is 1 minus P z inverse whole cubed multiplied by G z with P z inverse equal to 1. Agreed? A3 can also, A3 and B are known. These are known. All that you have to do now is to find A1 and A2. Obviously, if you want to apply the formula, you have to differentiate once, find A1, then you have to differentiate twice, find A2. Instead of doing that, what I do is, I take care of two specific values of Z inverse at your choice. Let us put Z inverse equal to 0. Then G of 0, Z, in, G, uh, Z inverse equal to 0. So, uh, small z would be infinity. Agreed? What is what is capital G of infinity? It is simply yes. A one plus A two plus A three plus B. A three and B are known. So I have got the value of G infinity, capital G infinity is equal to A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus B. So A1 plus A2 is equal to G infinity minus A3 minus B. This is my one of the equations. All right. The other equation, you put Z inverse equal to any other value that you like, 1. Okay. Or you can put minus 1 if you like. If I put 1, Z inverse equal to 1, so G is also equal to uh, equal to 1. That is equal to A1 divided by 1 minus P plus A2 divided by 1 minus P whole square plus A3 plus B. Once again, I get an equation in two variables, A1 and A2, because A3 and B are known. And I have two simultaneous equations, and I can solve them. Okay, A3 by 1 minus P whole cube and b by 1 minus alpha. These two are known. These two are known, so you can take them on the other side and make an equation in A1 and A2. This procedure, although a little bit of algebra, is much simpler and not prone to mistakes. Well, if you want to make a mistake, then nobody can stop you, but <laughs> there are less chances of making a mistake. I would suggest that you follow this. The other thing that one can do is, uh, I don't find that very convenient, but if you do, you can use that. What we do is, uh, we bring them under the same denominator. We simplify this. So I get in the numerator a polynomial, a polynomial in Z inverse with the constants A1, A2, A3 and B. A3 and B are known, so A1 and A2 you equate corresponding coefficients of, you can do that also, okay, if you find that to be more convenient. But I find this very convenient because Z inverse uh, I can choose at, at my sweet will, okay. Can I choose uh, Z inverse equal to infinity here as one of the values? Z inverse equal to infinity, all the terms will be 0. Why? Because the numerator degree was less than the denominator degree, so z inverse equal to infinity is not a is not a uh, proper choice. Z inverse equal to zero is a choice. Z inverse equal to plus one is a choice. Minus one is a choice. These are the simple choices, and this usually does the job. Okay, that's the case of repeated poles. <coughs> the inversion of z transform can also be done by long division. You see, all you have to do is to express g of z, p of z over q of z in this form. That is g0 plus g1 z inverse plus g2 g of 2 z to the minus 2 and so on. 
So, if we divide P of z by Q of z, long division, and take the, uh, what, is, what is it called, quotient, yes. quotient, take the quotient, quotient is a polynomial in z inverse, so the coefficients give you the sequence. The difficulty is that you may not be able to find a closed form formula. You may not be able to find in general a formula for g of n. You can find the individual coefficients, okay. Even if it is sine or cosine, you may not be able to guess what the exact formula. That is the only problem. But this also, we will take this also to illustrate the fact that the ROC is an extremely important attribute of a Z transform. We, we tacitly wrote this, but who told you that my, I, I want a causal, uh, causal sequence? I, I did not tell you. I did not specify the ROC, okay. But if it is causal, then this will be a correct representation. On the other hand, if it is anti-causal, then you have to express this long division such that your quotient is a polynomial in <coughs> z, not z inverse, okay. We will illustrate this with the help of uh, u of n. You know the, the z transform is 1 minus z inverse, okay. But suppose uh, <coughs> the nature of the sequence is not specified. You are only told that g of z is 1 minus z inverse find the inverse transform. Obviously, there can be multiple answers. The answer shall not be unique unless the ROC is specified. For example, I could write this as z divided by z minus 1. Agreed? And if I make a long division, then 1, so z minus 1, I get plus 1, then I get plus z inverse, Agreed? Plus z inverse, so you get 1 minus z inverse, the remainder is z inverse, then plus z to the minus 2, z to the minus 1, minus z to the minus 2, and so on. Therefore, the sequence would go like this 1 plus z inverse plus z to the minus 2, and so on. And obviously, the, the answer is 1, 1, 1, 1. This is n equal to 0. And therefore, the required sequence is u of n. Now, <coughs> this is one of the answers. What is the ROC of this? Obviously, this series converges. This series converges if mod z is greater than 1. So, the ROC is outside the unit circle. On the other hand, if I carry out the long division as it is, that is g of z equal to 1 by 1 minus z inverse as it is, that is minus z inverse plus 1 divides 1. Then minus z is the first quotient, minus z, so I get 1 minus z, there is plus z here. Then the next one is minus z to the power 2. So, I get z minus z squared, the remainder is z squared, so I get minus z to the 3 and so on. And you see the sequence is minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 to infinity, but it starts at n equal to 1. And therefore, for this z transform u of minus n minus 1 is a legal, legally valid candidate. Agreed? You must admit this also as one of the answers. And this series obviously converges for mod z less than 1. Therefore, if g of z is specified with an ROC mod z less than 1, then you know it is the anti-causal sequence. It is not u of minus n, u of minus n minus 1. Agreed? So, the ROC is extremely important. We shall take another example. <coughs> Pardon me? 
Yes. Thank you for pointing this out. It is minus u of minus n because the sequence values are minus 1. This is the correct answer. It is either u of n or minus u minus n minus 1. Agreed. Very good. I will take another example more interesting. Suppose I have <coughs> suppose I have uh, x sub z equals to z divided by z plus 0.5 and then z plus 1. All right. Suppose I have to find the ROC is not specified. Okay. I have to find the inverse transform. Then the first thing I do, obviously there will be multiple answers. Uh, <coughs> and you see the first thing I do is to write it as, poly, as a rational function in Z inverse. So I, I divide, let us take this as 2, not Z, 2, all right. The numerator is a constant. Then I divide by Z squared. So I get 2 Z to the minus 2, 1 plus 0.5 Z inverse, then 1 plus Z inverse. Agreed? Now you see here the numerator degree was less than the denominator degree, but in a rational function in Z inverse, the numerator degree is equal to the denominator degree. So in the partial fraction expansion, we shall have to take out a constant. And this constant obviously would be how much? 4. <laughs> 2z to the minus 2, 0.5z inverse z inverse, so it would be 4. How do I get that? Allow z inverse to go to infinity. Then in the numerator only this term, in the denominator this and this. Agreed? 4. Plus, well you can find out that this is one, 4 divided by 1 plus z inverse minus 8 divided by 1 plus 0.5z inverse you can make the partial fraction expansion. There is no other term. Okay. Now in the inversion we have a problem. Suppose, suppose the ROC is let us say 0.5, we are looking at possibilities. ROC has to be bounded by poles. The poles are at minus 0.5 and minus 1. Therefore, we can have an ROC like this. If it is bounded, it is the annular region between the two poles. Okay. If that is so, then which of these shall give you a left sided sequence? Which one will give you a right sided sequence? This will give you this will give you a left sided sequence LSS anti causal because mod z less than 1 and this will give you a right sided or causal sequence and therefore is the point clear yes. mod z greater than 0.5 indicates a right sided sequence therefore this term will correspond to a right sided sequence and naturally this will correspond to a left sided sequence. And if you now take the inverse, inverse z transform of this, then you shall get small x of n as equal to 4 delta n. Then what would be the inverse of 4 divided by 1 plus z inverse? Minus that sign will come minus 4. If the sign here was minus, then you have minus u of minus n minus 1. But since the sign is plus, what is the sequence? Minus 1 to the power n. Okay. So minus 4, one must be very careful, minus 1 to the n, then u of minus n minus 1. That is the inversion of the of the first of the second term, 4 by 1 plus z inverse. 
the third term is very easy minus 8 minus 0.5 do not make a mistake minus 0.5 to the power n u of n this is the sequence agreed. On the other hand if the ROC if the ROC is simply mod z less than 0.5 this is also possible then the total signal would be anti-causal and therefore x of n would be 4 delta n 4 delta n then minus 4 minus 1 to the n u of minus n minus 1 what would be the next term minus 8 minus 0.5 to the power n u of minus n minus 1 agreed it shall be plus 8 very good clear ok now <coughs> what is the other possibility mod z can be greater than 1 ok ROC mod z greater than 1 then what would be x of n it would be 4 delta n plus 4 minus 1 to the n u n minus 8 minus 0.5 to the power n u n you see there are there are three possibilities are there any other any other possibilities no because the ROC must be bounded by poles and we have we have poles where are the poles minus 1 minus 0.5 or plus 0.5 minus 0.5 ok minus 0.5 so the ROC ROC can be outside this region inside this region or the annular region then we have exhausted the possibilities ok therefore there are three answers to this question unless the ROC is specified or unless the nature of the sequence is specified if the sequence is totally causal then you have one answer totally anti causal one answer if it is a mixture of the two then you have the third answer. So uh, this example illustrates the importance of the ROC in specifying a Z transform. <coughs> Now we uh, talk about some properties of Z transforms exactly like those of the Fourier transforms. But then here when we talk about properties we have two sequences G and H n and the Z transforms are G of Z and H of Z with ROCs specified as R G and R H. RG stands for in general mod Z lying between RG1 and RG2 ok in general lying between two circles <coughs> annular region between two circles of radii RG1 and RG2 similarly RH is RH1 RH2. We shall also use this symbol ROC is 1 by RG. 1 by RG shall mean that mod Z lies between 1 by RG2 and 1 by RG1. We shall also use this symbol RGRH that is the product of the two this will stand for RG1 RH1 mod Z less than RG2 RH2 we shall use these symbols to discuss the properties there is no such complication in Fourier transform but Z transform has this complication. <coughs> now if you take the conjugate of a sequence then by applying the definition you can you can show that this is g star of 
Z star. It's very simple, just try the definition. Definition of the Fourier transform of this, then you can put it in that form. What do you think its region of convergence would be? Mod Z and mod Z star have the same value and therefore the ROC shall be the same as RG. Agreed? Is this clear? All right. <coughs> then um, if you take G of minus N, very easy, instead of Z to the minus N, you will have Z to the plus N. Therefore, this will be capital G of not Z, but Z inverse, 1 over Z. And what shall be the region of convergence? 1 by RG, that is correct. Z has gone to 1 by Z, therefore, the region of convergence is 1 by RG. Next. If you, well, this is this is very simple. Linearity alpha g n plus beta h n shall give rise to alpha capital G of z plus beta capital H of z. It's a linear transform. Then time shift. Oh, what is the RSC? Good question. <coughs> It shall, in, it shall include the overlap that is RG intersection RH, but that is not the total story. It can be wider than this, includes, includes this, but it can be wider than this. Suppose G of Z is Z inverse and h of z is 1 minus z inverse. Alpha and beta are 1, then the sum is 1. Therefore, all the whole of z plane is included. Isn't that right? Therefore, the ROC includes the intersection, but can be wider, can be bigger than this, because of the possibility of cancellation. Agreed? The other point, Suppose G of Z has a pole at alpha and H of Z also has a pole at alpha. Okay? The combination alpha and beta can be so chosen that the numerator has a 0 at alpha. Then the pole and 0 cancels. Is the point clear? And then that pole is unable to bound the region of convergence because that pole is unobservable and the region of convergence becomes wider. Is the point clear? So, the, the region of convergence of this includes the intersection, but it can be wider. Now, the next point G of n minus n 0 is simply z to the minus n 0 capital G of z. The region of convergence is R G is that all? The factor Z to the minus N zero shall also contribute to poles. If N zero is a positive integer, then the point at the origin shall be excluded. So except possibly z equal to 0. On the other hand, if n 0 is a negative integer, then the point at infinity except possibly z 0, z equal to 0 or z equal to infinity. You must find the ROC very carefully, very carefully. Um, <coughs> one more before we conclude the class. Alpha to the n, if you multiply g of n by alpha to the n, then from the definition z to the minus n alpha to the n would be z by alpha to the power minus n. Agreed? What I am saying is z to the minus n alpha to the n g n, the summation of this and this can be written as z by alpha to the power minus n. Therefore, the z transform would be capital G of z by alpha and what is the ROC? mod of z by alpha 
the ROC is RG, therefore alpha times RG. You must find this out very carefully. And I think we will close at this point.